Hello, hello everyone. Hello, Photopioners. Uh, welcome to another masterclass. Today we have the great Samner ready and she will teach us how to compose our images or give us a talk about photography composition and color. Samna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Rafael. I'm excited to be on the PhotoPills platform. Thanks to all who are joining in. Uh, we're going to try to keep this somewhat informal, so please feel free to send in your questions and I'll try to take them through the talk. Um, we're going to talk about uh, composition and color today. I threw these slides together last night. <laughs> so um, I am going to try to go through a topic that I have spoken on quite often, actually, and I'm very passionate about, um, but we'll keep it informal uh, and take your yes. questions along the way. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Sana. Yes, yeah, so you have questions, just uh, post them in the chat because we have, as always, uh, the great Sandra Ayabra with us and she will be sharing your questions uh, with us so Sandra can answer them for you. So, uh, Sandra, for people that doesn't know you, give me five cents on who you are, what you do. I know you're a professional photographer, but... Uh, Sure. Uh, so currently I'm pursuing a dual career. Um, I work as a radiologist. I'm actually super specialized in pediatric radiology. So about uh, 40 to 50 percent of my time is spent in medicine and then uh, about uh, 50 to 60 percent is spent in photography. I work three days a week as a radiologist. I analyze images hoping to establish diagnosis and aid cure and um, when I'm not doing that, I'm out in the field hoping to generate images that offer visual therapy, um, both to the person who's creating the images as well as to the people who are viewing them. A lot of my artwork tends to be displayed in medical centers. So my primary purpose and emphasis in creating images is to generate those kinds of images that bring serenity, calmness, mm -hmm. and create an ambiance of healing that's primarily what I focus on. And uh, I thoroughly enjoy teaching. So I conduct uh, workshops, both domestic and uh, international. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey so far. I yeah. will be transitioning to a full-time photographer in summer of 2024. So super excited for that. Yeah, I'm sure you you managed to do that because you've been telling me that you've been uh, so much busy, you know, working on many, many workshops been on worship this year and for next year too. So I'm excited. And I love your work and your, your photography. It was great to meet you and in Canap in Utah. <laughs> yes, it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I took advantage of it and invite you to uh, to uh, here to present and also to the Photo Pills camp in 2024. Yes. How you can make it. Yes, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, Sandra. If you want, we can go to the presentation because I know we have over two hundred people uh, here with us live. Oh wow! Um, Hi everyone. Oh, yeah, hello. And we're all looking forward to learn how you build your images and how you use composition. Okay. All right. All right. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Yep. Uh, I have it here. So when you tell me share it, I'll, I'll share it. Okay. I think uh, so. I can. Yep. Okay. I'm going to try to go maximize the screen now. Are you seeing it, Raphael? Yes, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> so let's start off with uh, composition and color in landscape photography. Probably the two most important elements, right? Okay, so jumping into it, I already talked a little bit about myself. My website is sapnaready.com. You can go over there and check out more of my work. Let's delve into the <clears throat> topic right off the bat. Let's talk a little bit about composition first. In composition, I want to talk about these um, topics. How are you going to identify focal points or visual elements? What is it that the story is about? Who is the protagonist of your visual story? Then how are we going to arrange those visual elements, right? We have seen something in the scene, we're attracted to it, we wanna make a story about it. How are you going to arrange those visual elements in an aesthetic fashion? Because that is what composition is all about. The next thing 
we need to talk about is because when you're standing at a scene, you're investing all of your senses in it and you're having a 3D experience, there is a certain emotional response that evokes in, that is evoked in you, right? Now your task as a photographer is to take that 3D experience and condense it into a 2D flat plate. And then you have to present this picture to a viewer and hope that they feel the same sort of emotional response that you experienced while you were in the field. One of the primary things that we use when we go from a 3D, from a three-dimensional experience to a 2D flat plate is that sense of depth. So it's important to understand how can we bring back that sense of depth. And then the fourth thing I want to talk about is that 3D feeling with a visual pathway being created. So in each of these instances, let's look at specific examples and see how we can optimize both in the field as well as in post-processing to make truly compelling images. Yeah. Once, and, no, so yeah. No, and don't forget that at the end of the theory, we're gonna be reviewing, reviewing the photos that we re received from the community. So just guys, be atten uh, pay attention, stay with us till the end because we're gonna be reviewing, Sana, we're gonna be reviewing some of the photos that you submitted these days. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, no. That It's good you said that because I think once you go through this presentation, it's kind of nice to review your own images and say, well, how many of these principles or guidelines have I really applied in capturing my own images and processing them? So that's um, a good thing. Once we are done with composition, we'll jump into color, understand what color wheel is, what is color theory, uh, how do you convey a certain mood through your images using color? Again, how can you add depth to an image using color? And how do you guide a viewer's eye through the frame with the use of color? Sounds good? Let's jump in. I like to put up this slide to mention the creative vision of the photographer, you know. When, when we go uh, to photograph something, what, what must happen? What is the sequence of events that we go through? First of all, observation, right? You're standing there observing how the light plays across the landscape and thinking of what is the best way to portray this? Because the nature of light will determine what the story is that needs to be told. Think of it like a drama unfolding on a stage. If you are looking at a protagonist, the spotlight needs to be on the protagonist when the protagonist is delivering a dialogue, isn't it? That's how a visual element plays out in the landscape as well. When the light illuminates a certain part of the landscape, it is that part of the landscape that becomes important in the visual story. So observe how the light is playing through the scene. Next. We have to have an emotional connection to what we are shooting. If we don't connect emotionally to what is in front of us, then how can we expect the viewer to do the same, right? So oftentimes I encourage people to just go out there and scout and get to know the landscape, even before you try to make an image out of it. Feel that connection, understand the place, because once you feel that connection, the images will come to you and the landscape will speak to you. And then of course, we must master the skills to be able to capture the scene, right? If we are struggling with camera settings and we are struggling with our gear, then how can the aesthetic side of our brain take over? We literally should be so comfortable with our gear that it feels like an extension of a hand, you know, just like you don't think when you eat, drink, or walk, shooting should be at that subconscious level. So you get used to your gear. You don't have to think about it. And all you have to focus on are the aesthetic parts of image creation. And then, of course, the final step is learning how to post-process our images. Oftentimes, I have workshop clients standing before the same scene, and each person comes back with a completely different kind of image. Why is that? Because the way we see, the way we emotionally connect, the way we shoot, 
and the way we render is very heavily based on who we are as individuals. So we tend to put a piece of ourselves into the image and make it our own. So that process of image rendition is where you infuse your personal creative vision into the image and is extremely important step in the final product. So first and foremost, we need to have an awareness of light, right? And I love this quote by Elliot Derwitt, which says, all the technique in the world does not compensate for the inability to notice. Mm -hmm. So if you're standing there and you just, you know, pressing the shutter randomly and not really observing the nuances of light, not really paying attention to the visual elements that are calling out to you, then the images you generate will simply not be compelling. Yeah, I suppose that planning for the light you want, light direction, light type is very important, right? Exactly. So, you know, if you have harsh light or flat light across the landscape, it becomes very difficult to create an interesting image. Uh, when you have light and shadow interplaying with each other, when you have angled light hitting the landscape, that's why we love to shoot sunrises and sunsets, right? Because that angled light, I will show you how, creates a more 3D effect and adds depth mm -hmm. to the image. Okay. So now you're standing in front of the scene, right? And you're looking at it and you're like, Sapna, I really don't know what the story is about. You say I'm supposed to identify focal points. I'm supposed to identify visual elements. But right now, I don't even know what the story is about. What should I make the story about? All through evolution, our eyes have been trained to look at certain things. What's that? Brightness, color, contrast, and texture. These are the four elements that the human eye is drawn to. Therefore, we can capitalize on these four elements when we are trying to identify focal points. For example, in this image that I have up here, this was taken in dead clay. This is the salt pan that is created by a dried up river. And on it, we have these graceful dead trees. When the wind kicks up, you have sandstorms coming through. And as you can see, this was shot during a period of angled light. The light is streaming in from the top left corner and you can see how it is illuminating the sand that is blowing. If you're standing at this scene and asking yourself, I wonder what the story needs to be about, then look, where is the brightness in the image? Where is the light? It's illuminating the sand that is blowing, isn't it? Where is the color? The color is again illuminating, it's seen in the sand that is blowing. And then you look at contrast. The contrast in this image is so dramatic. As soon as you look for what is it that is most contrasting in this image, right off the bat, you'd realize it is a story about these trees. This is where my eye and the viewer's eye is going to land in the scene. There's no doubt about it. Once we know that, then it becomes easier. Once we have identified the focal points of the visual elements, it becomes easier to say, let me construct the visual story around these main characters. Texture is another thing that the human eye is uh, drawn to. Also, if you have a human element or an animal in the scene, that tends to act as an anchor for our eye as well. So let's take a look at specific examples now. In this scene, if you ask yourself, what is this story about? There should be no doubt in your mind, right? You are seeing a tree that is illuminated and that has some color and contrast. So your eye is automatically going to go to that point and then it will travel upwards towards the curve in the dunes. This is the same place, dead clay in Namibia. And you see how the sharp contrast between what is in light and what is in shadow draws your eye. So what are we doing here? We're telling the viewer, look at the tree, then let your eye travel upwards through the frame. Mm -hmm. And so that was the reason why I composed in this way. And when you begin to think in that fashion, you begin to discard the notion that everything needs to be composed by a rule of thirds 
or that your focal point necessarily needs to be offset in order for it to work. Every landscape scene must be treated individually when you analyze it. You cannot go with a preset guideline and say that's going to work across the board. It's not because you need to understand what the story is about and shape the story around the main character, discarding anything else. And then see, is it working out? Is it aesthetic? Is the eye going where I want it to go? Here, if you ask yourself, what is this story about, right? Again, you're going to look at the point of brightness and color, which is the cactus. It is welcoming the viewer into the composition. And from there, we are going to go up to the mountain with the light on it, right? So again, what is working in our favor? We are having light and color work together in creating this scene. Hmm. That's Cathedral Rock, right? In uh, Sedona. Yes. Yes, it ah, is, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Beautiful I was place. There earlier uh, this year, I was doing a project for Sony over there. And actually, right. it turned out to be a very interesting project. It's uh, The whole story is available on YouTube, if you guys oh. want to see. Um, I had to make a couple of visits to make a compelling story come true. And mm -hmm. it's a very interesting place to do that. Very nice. Uh, Sanna, if you want to use your mouse to point out parts in the photo, you can do it. You have the pointer there. OK. You, know, you see it? Yeah, I see it. Uh, cool, cool. OK. Perfect. All right. So sometimes you're standing at a scene and it looks beautiful, right? This is Yosemite. And you're asking yourself, well, so much is going on here. What am I going to look at? I promise you, if you focus on the simple principles of brightness, contrast, color, and texture, the answer will come to you every single time. Right? So for example, here you see the fog flowing through the valley. It's bright, right? So your eyes will go to that. You'll see the waterfall. Why? Because it is being illuminated and it is bright. And then your eye will automatically travel to the areas of color. So you see the fog, the waterfall, and the trees in color is what your eye will travel around. And that's what the story is about. So let's talk about, okay, so we said we know how to identify our focal points now because we're going to use brightness, contrast, color, and texture. Now that I've identified my focal points, what am I going to do next? It's my job now to arrange them in an aesthetic fashion. How am I going to do that? What is um, the method I'm going to apply for arrangement of the visual elements? Under this, I would like to talk about weight distribution, the use of negative space, how geometry can be used to create compelling images, and how to reduce distractions. Now, why is it important when you're composing to not only look at your main focal point, but also to look around and see what is happening along the periphery? Is there something that is attracting the viewer's eye that would force them to go out of my frame? Then I need to reduce those distractions. Let's take a look at examples for each. Here, if I ask you, guys, you now know how to identify focal points. What is the story about? You're going to say, aha, there is brightness to the water, so my eye is going to go over there. That's a strong visual element in this composition. Since there is a lot of color on the foliage, that is the other part of the composition that is very important, and my eye is going to go over there. So in this story, I have two main characters, right? I have the waterfall and I have the color in the foliage. So how am I going to arrange it? How you distribute the visual elements in your frame is very important and we need to do it with balance. Every pixel in our frame is important. We don't want to waste any real estate, right? We want everything to add up to a compelling story and we're going to place our visual elements in such a way that there is a nice dialogue going on between them in the frame. Think of it as actors on a stage, right? You are unfolding a play on the stage. You now have two characters on the stage. They kind of need to look at each other and there needs to be light on them so the audience can see them and they need to interact with each other with a dialogue, right? That's what is going on here. You see the foliage is leaning in towards the waterfall and leading your eye towards it. If you look at the line of 
um, weight distribution here. This is called the Baroque diagonal. This is very pleasing for an aesthetic composition. I wish we would talk about the Baroque diagonal more than we talk about the rule of thirds. Everybody loves the rule of thirds, right? But see, in nature, objects are spread out over the region. The waterfall is not going to be at one point, right? It's going to spread across a geographic region in the frame. So if you say I'm going to compose according to the rule of thirds and just stick with it, it becomes difficult. But if you say I'm going to divide my frame into subdivisions and make sure that each part of the frame has an interesting story, that's a better way to approach composition. Usually when we read, majority of us, we go from left to right, correct? When we read an image, we go from top to bottom or bottom to top, depending on your preference. Usually when we have visual elements arranged in this oblique pattern, the Baroque diagonal, our eye travels through the frame much better. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Start using diagonals rather than straight lines when we are composing. And you see how the weight has been distributed in the frame. I have 50% of the real estate given to the waterfall, 50% of the real estate given to my foliage. Why? Because I want both of them to have equal significance on the stage. Now, you might think differently and say, Sapna, I'm more drawn to the waterfall than I am to the foliage. That's fine. In that case, you would give more real estate to the waterfall and just use the foliage to anchor your composition. But that must be a deliberate, conscious choice you're making, saying, this is the story. For me, I had two main characters, right? So that's why I divided the frame in this manner. But you might have one main character, the waterfall, and the foliage is your supporting character. Then you need to divide the frame, keeping that in mind to tell the story. Here is another example. This is in China. This is the place that actually inspired the Avatar movie. Absolutely spectacular to visit. Uh, I had a workshop set up there before the pandemic and was super excited to go back. But you know what? Our best laid plans don't work out, right? The pandemic uh, had other plans for me, so I could never go back here. You see, when you ask yourself, what is this story about? Well, the mountain has a lot of color and there is fog around it, adding contrast. So that's an important visual element. And then the tree, the bottom right, has this tree with color and again, fog around it, adding contrast. So there are at least two visual elements that your eye is immediately drawn to. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to say this story is about the mountain and this tree. Again, the Baroque diagonal comes into play and notice how I have distributed the weight in the composition between the two visual elements that I want to make the story about. If I say now, I'm going to go use the rule of thirds. I want you to see how the rule of thirds wouldn't work here because sometimes it does and sometimes it's a good way to start when you don't know how to compose. But I encourage people to use diagonals rather than straight lines because see that mountain is not really on the left third, is it? This tree is not exactly where the lines inter intersect on the bottom right kind of in the territory, and so the diagonal works better than using intersecting points. You can get more complex with your composition and start analyzing each individual subdivision, like all these rectangles that we have generated. You can look at each of them and ask yourself, does every part of this composition have significant uh, story to tell? Because if you're including a part that is really not relevant, you're just diluting a story, right? When you're telling a story, you want to incorporate only words that increase the impact of the story. Adding a whole bunch of unnecessary words to your story just dilutes your story, right? So when you look at the frame, go around, look at the entire frame, add the margins, everything, and make sure that every subdivision is adding to the main story. 
So we talked about weight distribution. Now I want to talk a little bit about negative space. I said, we know how to identify focal points. We know how to arrange them, right? But having space around the main visual elements is also important because we call this visual separation. For example, think if you are um, shooting the reflection of a mountain, right? And you have some flowers in your foreground. It is important to make sure that the flowers in your foreground are not obscuring a part of the reflection of your mountain, right? Because then you're sort of hiding uh, some of the story. So every time you look at your composition, ask yourself, have I given myself enough negative space around the main visual element so that it can come out louder? Okay, let's take a look at specific examples. Here, we have a ton of negative space, right? This is a very minimalistic composition. Again, going back to dead play and looking at those dead trees. When I stand before the scene, I know right off the bat what this is about right? Because there is sharp contrast of those trees. So the main characters in this play, the focal points in this composition are the three trees. I want all three trees, all three characters to have equal prominence. So what am I going to do? I'm going to stand at a place where I can give each of them enough space so there is no crowding and they all look separated from each other. Now, if I wanted to use the rule of thirds here, I would fail, right? Why would I fail? Because see how crowded the trees would get if I push them together at the points. I can't even do it. That's not how they are set up in nature. But more importantly, look at the line that is separating the salt pan from the dune that is illuminated. The reason why this image works is because I'm achieving contrast separation between the trees and the illuminated background. If I put the salt pan at that bottom third, what would that do? It would basically chop off the trees in half. It would reduce the impact that you're gonna get. So you see how rule of thirds would absolutely fail in this instance. So once you understand it, understand the concept behind it, just discard it and start analyzing each individual composition separately and asking yourself, what should I be doing here? The story is all about the trees with the backdrop of the dune. Then the real estate must go towards the trees and the backdrop. I also want to indicate that these dunes are massive. How will I do that? By giving you a ton of negative space behind the tree, telling you the trees are small, the dune is big. And that's how we tell the story. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sarnal, how did you decide the, the space uh, below the tree, from the tree to the bottom of the photo? That, that little space that you have, which looks very nice. Uh, so, how, did, yeah. uh, how did you come up with the, that amount of, is it the same as the amount on the right and uh, right tree and left tree to the, core, to the, to the photo, to the frame? Or I tried. So let, let's, that's great you asked that question, right? You'll say, how much of the salt pan should I have included? Mm -hmm. Enough to not make the trees look crowded because you want to give space to those main focal elements, right? So I need to show you the base of the tree and also need to clear it with some negative space. So it looks massive, right? It looks yeah. Uh, yeah. much more aesthetic. If I cut off the bottom of the trees, that would not be a compelling, like if an actor is on stage, you want to see the whole actor. You don't want to like miss out seeing the legs, right? It's the same. You want to see the entire character. And uh, on the sides, I want to show a little bit of space because you don't want to cut off one, um, one branch or uh, crowd the trees together. So again, the use of negative space is basically to enhance what's happening in the middle and sort mm -hmm. of step back and say, look at the big picture, especially because we want to convey a sense of massive scale for the dune, it becomes very important to do mm -hmm. that. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Here is another example again. You know, um, I showed this picture to one of my clients and they said, Sapna, wouldn't it have been better if you had taken the picture when the kayakers we're sitting closer to the camera. In other words, you would have cleared the reflection of the mountain 
and shown the kayakers in the foreground. That is a very valid point, isn't it? Because if the reflection is part of the story, why would I want to obscure it by placing the kayakers on top of it? But you see that reflection, there was wind that day and the reflection wasn't really panning out. The water was moving and not only that, because the kayakers are moving, I can't really do a very long exposure to optimize the reflection. I have to catch the kayakers without any motion, which means it's going to be a shorter exposure. If I'm going to do a shorter exposure, the reflection is not going to be that great. It doesn't really add to the visual story. So instead of showing you a crappy reflection, I am going to hide the crappy reflection with a very strong focal point. So you go look at the kayakers, you look at the mountain, and you take in the scene completely. So the way I'm using negative space here is to anchor the eye on the kayakers and then travel upwards through the frame. Okay, so we talked about weight distribution and we talked about negative space. Let's talk a little bit about geometry. When we start shooting along with the rule of thirds, a very important concept that we are introduced to is that of leading lines, right? Everybody says, use leading lines, use leading lines, lead the viewer into the frame. Okay, so in this instance, are there leading lines? Yes. We have these diagonal lines uh, coming in with the moss uh, covered rocks that are partially submerged, right? Everything is telling you go towards the waterfall, look at the waterfall, right? So it works great. Let's take a look at these additional leading lines that are implied. So on the left side, uh, we have a stream that's coming down. Even though it's coming down, it's actually leading us into the frame, isn't it? We step into that stream and then our eyes travel towards the mountain. So it's acting as a uh, strong guide for how the viewer's eye should travel through the frame. So geometry, especially with leading lines, is very important in creating compelling compositions. On the right-hand side, you can see I went a little bit overboard, if you ask me, with trying to create that leading line. There was some differential light there because this part of the mud cracks were drier and you know the mud cracks that were next to them were not as dry so those looked darker and these looked brighter and especially when the angled light hits it it forms a really good leading line going up towards the mountain so geometry leading lines we love those but there is another concept i want you to understand it's a little bit more advanced from just using leading lines Remember that Baroque diagonal I talked about earlier? Guess what? Lines that are going along the Baroque diagonal, so they're going from bottom left to top right, tend to create energetic images. So you convey a feeling of enthusiasm, adventure, positivity, you know, like high energy. Lines that go the other way, that is they go from top left to bottom right tend to convey serenity, calmness, a kind of a quiet tone to your image. So if you understand that geometry, when you are standing before a scene in nature, you can ask yourself, what kind of image do I want to create? Do I want to create something that is energetic and uplifting? Then I'm going to go upwards along the Baroque diagonal with my lines. And if I want to create a calm scene, I'm going to come the other way, the reverse diagonal. This concept is a little bit difficult to grasp. And, you know, um, but the more you practice it, the more evident it becomes. And uh, nature it gives us whatever there is in front of us, right? We can't decide how to frame our lines. But just having this in the back of your mind when you're looking at a scene will at least tell you which direction you can take it in. You know, do you want to generate an energetic image or do you want to generate a calming one and maybe applying yourself to that? Now, of course, there are a lot of other things that determine whether you're going to end up with an energetic image or a calming image, right? Because color has a huge influence on that. The quality of light has a huge influence on that. But right now, we're focusing on just geometry. We'll go to the other factors later. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the last thing I want to talk about is reducing distractions. This is one of the most common mistakes we make when we are composing, right? 
we are so focused on our main focal point that we forget there are some distracting supporting characters that need to be removed right if there is a supporting character in our composition it should lend more significance to our focal point the main visual element right? for example these flowers here those are deliberate right those are supporting characters those little flowers that are sitting on the rock they are actually are also telling us to travel they're telling the eye to travel towards the flowers and then leading it up to the waterfall. But say if those flowers, a couple of them, were strewn at the very edge of our frame, right? Like bottom left or bottom right, like half cut off. You have two flowers in frame and one is sort of dangling off. What happens is, remember, our eye goes to the point of brightness and contrast and color. Your eye will go to that distracting element at the edge of the frame and it will travel out of the frame. So instead of keeping the viewer focused on what your story is about, you're now pointing the spotlight at the edge of the stage and the viewer is no longer paying attention to the drama that you want them to see in the center stage. So important to do that border patrol, go around. And if you see some flowers that are indeed bright, like look at the top right corner, there are some flowers there that we're catching light, right? I don't want your eye to go there then I'm going to burn them. I'm going to decrease the saturation. I'm going to decrease the light in that area, apply a vignette and say, don't look there. Don't get out of my frame. Stay in the middle of my frame and focus on the waterfall. Everything good so far? <clears throat> Great. Okay. Yes, I think everybody is like lured. Uh, almost 300 people. Awesome. 294. So. Very happy. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Thank you all so much. And I'm sorry that I'm not telling you funny stories today and that I'm not entertaining <laughs> you because there is so much to get through. Normally, I am much more fun, I assure you. <laughs> but today, there is a lot to get through. So I'm trying to keep it together here. Um, so in a scene like this, it becomes difficult, isn't it? Because you have trees. And you know you're not supposed to cut off trees, but sometimes our camera can only capture so much. So you're thinking, Sapna, how can I make this so the eye doesn't travel out of the frame? Again, notice how I applied a vignette. I tried to incorporate the trees with maximum color in the middle and sort of the ones with less leaves in the periphery, hoping that your eye doesn't go there. And then I am throwing all this warm color and light. It's already there in the frame, but I'm accentuating it in post-processing as well and saying, guys, look at the middle of the frame. You can rest on the rock because there's contrast there. Step into my frame, go into the middle ground, see all that water swirling around, and then travel your eye through the foliage into the beautiful light on the rocks above. Okay, <clears throat> now this is a very important concept to understand, right? Remember I said, we have a very daunting task before us. We stood in front of a scene and captured it. We saw it three-dimensional. We experienced a certain emotion. We were excited about it. But now you have a 2D flat plate. And now you're presenting that to the viewer and asking yourself, how can I convey this feeling of depth through the image? How am I going to make my image look 3D? I guarantee you, if you go to any online platform that is displaying images and feel attracted to a certain image, ask yourself, what is it about this image that I find so attractive? And nine times out of 10, it'll be because it makes you feel like you're there, like you're standing there, like you're stepping into the frame. And how is that accomplished? By adding that sense of depth to your image. Very simple to do this, guys. Once you understand this concept, I promise you, apply it. Every one of your images, you can bring out depth. You can go from a 2D flat plate to something that feels much more 3D. Ready for this? This is called mm -hmm. applying transitions. Remember, when we're standing at a scene, what is close to us tends to be very sharp, right? Our eyes see it very defined, textured, with contrast and color. What is in the distance? Think of looking at some mountains in the distance. They tend to be soft, muted not as sharp. So our eyes are trained to tell our brain, hey, what is close to us here, what is what is sharply in focus is what is close to us. 
And that thing that you're seeing in the distance, which is blurred, is actually farther away. That's what we need to capitalize on when we look at our images. So you see what here, I actually should say the picture on the right, I did make a mistake because the bottom left should have been in sharper focus, but my story was about the trees in the background. So please forgive me for not having this tree in sharp focus on the bottom left. It was a lot of depth of field there as well, and I'm in a kayak and moving. But the idea is that as you go towards the back of your frame, you want it to be softer. And that is the transition. So we go from dark to light, cool to warm, desaturated to saturated, sharp to soft, and texture to smooth. Each of these transitions are already present in your frame, but you want to accentuate them in post-processing to increase the depth through the image. Let's take a look at specific examples. Okay, these are three instances where I feel that the depth is being conveyed through an image. We love our wide angle lenses, right? Why? Because we can get really close to the foreground. We can sit down, make these tiny flowers or small bubbles, make up, they appear gigantic in our wide angle lens. And then we can lead the viewer's eye, right? You get those broad lines coming in when you use the wide angle. We love to use that. And how are we conveying depth through the image? Notice how in each of these images, transitions have been applied. They were present in the frame, but did I accentuate them in post-processing? Absolutely, right? So if you look at the um, foreground, it tends to be darker, right? The background is more illuminated. The foreground is sharper, the background is softer. The foreground tends to be cooler, the background tends to be warmer. So by applying these transitions, I was able to convey a sense of depth through the images. <laughs> okay, now we are moving on, right? So we finished adding depth, now we're going to do one more thing. How are we going to get that 3D feeling back? One more concept to understand is called shading the apple. Why do we like periods of angled light? Because it gives you that 3D feeling. What do I mean by that? Look at the apple on the left-hand side. Notice how the light is flat and it is falling all around the apple equally. That doesn't feel very attractive, does it? But now look at the apple on the right-hand side. And all of a sudden, you see that there is angled light. There is light, there is shadow. A 3D relief is being depicted and it's literally like you can reach in, take that apple and start eating it, isn't it? Did I accentuate the sharpness of the dew drops? Absolutely. Did I accentuate the texture on the apple and the colors? Yes, because doing all of that adds to that 3D feeling, okay? Shading the apple. How does this work in nature? Every time you're out there trying to shoot a sunrise or a sunset, the reason you're doing that is because specifically you're looking for that angled light when a part of your visual element is going to be in light and a part of it is going to be in shadow. That's what we're doing here, right? I know that El Capitan will get light in the morning on one face and then there'll be another face of El Capitan which will not have light. The mountains on the right will not have light because the light is coming from behind. Having that differential light is what gives it a 3D feeling. How did I enhance that 3D feeling? I got low down on the water. I made these mounds of uh, grass with snow bigger. So you get that feeling of depth. So you have a strong foreground component. It's sharp, it's textured. But again, notice how I go from dark to light from sharp to soft, from cool to warm, all of those transitions have been applied. And on top of that, I'm using the angled light to create the 3D relief. That's how we make it a more 3D image. Sometimes you may not have a strong foreground element, right? And then you're like, Sapna, how do I add depth and 3D feeling to an image when that is the case? Same principles, guys. When you have light beaming in from a side, 
the transition now is going to go from the brighter part of the image to the darker part of the image. That transition also adds depth. Did I use a leading line along the way? Yes. Again, look at the transitions. The foreground is darker. The background is brighter. The foreground is sharper, desaturated. The background is illuminated, soft, light, warm. All of the transitions have been applied, even though we're coming through with angled light, and therefore, this image will feel more 3D. Backlight, very, very important, right? This is a nice example because I want you to look at the bottom left flower, that one that is all white, right? That one was actually in the shade. So what did I do? I just dodged it. But notice how when you just dodge something, right, all you're doing is adding flat light on it. That will not make it appear 3D. Now look at the flowers in the middle, bottom frame, right, at the bottom of the frame. These flowers in the middle are actually being backlit by the light of the setting sun. And as a result, you feel the 3D effect on the petals. They're so translucent. It's like you can reach out and touch them, right? So that backlight is very important because it's creating the interplay between light and shadow to render something 3D. That is not happening on the flower which is on the bottom left because it is all in the shade. So you need to know the decisive moment when light is traveling across the landscape to know when we should be shooting it to make something feel 3D. If you don't do that, no matter how much post-processing you do, if the time wasn't right, if the quality of light wasn't right, your image is really not going to have that 3D feeling. So important to keep that in mind. Yes, and you have an app to plan for that, right? So the photo pills. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, how could we forget that? Absolutely. Um, okay, so... These are all the things we talked about so far, right? Identifying focal points, arrangement of visual elements, adding depth to an image, adding a 3D feeling to the image, all combined to create a visual pathway. You've heard this buzzwords, right? Create a visual pathway, create a visual pathway. What that basically says is, say you took a picture, right? And you have finished post-processing it and you put it on your um, computer and you're looking at it. I want you to consciously close your eyes and then I want you to open them and ask yourself, how is my eye traveling through the frame? Where does it enter the frame? How does it go through the frame? Where does it land? Is it landing on the points that I want the viewer to see? If it's not doing that, then you have not really completed your visual story. How are we gonna achieve that? It's called shaping the light, guys. So this is actually an image that was submitted for photo review. This is not one of my images, but I decided to use it to sort of tell you the story of the visual pathway, right? So the, the original image that was submitted for the review is on the left-hand side, and the image that I edited briefly, this look like it took less than uh, 10 to 15 seconds, is on the right-hand side. So forgive me if it's a dirty edit, but I just wanted to prove a point. The thing is that when I look at the left-hand side image, right, what is this story about? I ask myself, and I know there is a beautiful tree on an illuminated rock that is lining up so beautifully with the Milky Way. Gorgeous, right? I like the way the water is swirling around the rocks. I like how the foreground rocks add a little bit of texture to the frame. What is it that I don't like about this? If you look at the top left and top right, we have some branches coming in. Now, the photographer might have felt this is a great way to frame my Milky Way. But when you look at it, because those are areas of sharp contrast, what is going to happen is when the viewer looks at this frame, they will look at the water, look at the tree, go to the Milky Way, and before you know it, their eye will be drawn to the edges of the frame because of the stark contrast. And what's happening? You're diverting your viewer away from your main focal point and in fact, taking their eye out of the frame. That cannot happen. That simply cannot happen because it subtracts 
from the emotional component that you're trying to put in that Milky Way and in that tree. So my approach to it would be reduce distractions that are along the periphery, decide what the story is about, and make it as simple as possible. Remember, less words is a better story, right? You don't need a whole lot of unnecessary words in your story. So by removing, all I did is crop this image, right? So I've removed what was on the periphery and then I cooled it down just a little bit, okay? Because I wanted that difference to pop between the warm light in the rocks and the warm uh, light uh, of the Milky Way from the coolness of the water, right? So the water is not as yellow as it was in the previous image. This literally took 10 to 15 seconds. And I think now you're telling a much more compelling story and saying, there is no doubt whatsoever in anybody's mind who the main characters are in this story now. So that's how I would do it. Okay. <clears throat> there is one more concept I need to introduce to you guys, and that is the concept of visual tension. See, here in this image, you would look at the tree right off the bat because it has this dramatic, colorful foliage. So now with everything you know, you know, Sapna, I know that the tree is an important visual element in this composition. Since the human eye is drawn to a point of brightness and contrast, I know the bird is an important visual element in this composition. I know you're trying to distribute weight equally because you want to give as much importance to both visual elements. So what did you do? Try to balance the composition with the tree and the bird. Because you want to use leading lines or geometry in your composition, the branches of the tree are primarily leading towards the bird. The bird's beak is a line that is leading back to the tree. So we are using geometry and lines to direct the viewer's eye from the tree to the bird and from the bird to the tree. Notice how everything else around the periphery has been vignetted out. Why? Because we don't want the viewer to go there. We don't want the viewer to travel out of the frame just because some branches are sticking towards the periphery of the frame. So we desaturate them. We decrease the prominence of those branches by decreasing luminosity, applying a vignette and saying, listen, spotlight is in the center. Focus on the main characters in the story. The concept of visual tension is that after you have identified who the main characters are in your play and you have them up on the stage, how would the drama unfold if the characters don't even look at each other? In order for it to be an effective dialogue, each visual element must play off of the other. So if you have two main visual elements, those two must interact with each other in your frame. What do I mean by that? Now, if this bird was looking towards the right side, you know what would happen? You would look at the tree, which would lead you to the bird. The bird would be looking outside the frame. The viewer's eye travels off the frame. If the branches of the tree were pointing to the left side and the tree was the bird was pointing to the right side, you have a whole bunch of negative space in the middle. What is your story about? You've lost it already, right? So it's not only enough to identify what the focal points are, to arrange them aesthetically so that you have a good weight distribution, to give negative space to, so you isolate each of those visual elements, but you also need to understand that there has to be a positive visual tension between the main characters in your story in order for the story to become compelling. Hope that all made sense. Let's take a look at another example, right? Sometimes, see that bird and uh, tree, I like to give that example because it's immediately obvious when I talk about that, right? But then you look at something like this and you're like, dang, I don't really know what's going on here. So let's break it down into the basics again. What does the eye go to? Point of brightness, that wave that is cresting on the shore, yup. Clouds that are illuminated with light and filtering between the mountains, yup. Color. Because you have color on the mountain, you're going to look at it. So what are the visual elements that are playing in this scene? You have the mountain with the color. You have the waves crashing against the shore. And then you have the clouds swirling around. Okay, so we have identified the three visual elements now. Now we want to keep the viewer's eye in that cycle. 
or in that triangle, right? You can call it a circle or a triangle and say, okay, step into my frame, look at the mountain, go to the cloud, come to the ocean, go back to the mountain, keep going in that. Notice how the periphery doesn't really have much interest because we don't want to direct the viewer sign away from it. Okay, so in summary, coming to the end of the composition section, we learned how to identify focal points by using brightness, contrast, color, and texture. We learned how to arrange visual elements with weight distribution, negative space, using geometry, reducing distractions, remembering to do that border patrol. Then we learned how to adapt to an image, the concept of transitions. We learned how to create a 3D feeling for the image, shading the apple, using the angled light. And finally, creating a visual pathway where we are very, very deliberate in how we direct the viewer's eye through the composition, where we invite it in, where we want to lead it through, and where we want it to land. These principles, if you apply them consciously while in the field and in post-processing, I assure you, they will result in compelling images. So Raphael, maybe we should take a break and take questions if they have any before we jump into color. If you guys have any question, uh, let us know now. Um, okay. Don't have any question so far. Everybody was like uh, lured into the theory and all your photos have a lot of positive positive comments. Uh, oh, so glad uh, to hear. It. It's always so hard when you're giving a talk and you can't see the people because you know if like I'm giving a talk and somebody is sleeping, I have the habit of going right by them. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't do yeah. that. We don't have any control. And I'm sorry that, uh, you know, if it gets to be a bit long, forgive me for that. Remember, you can always take a break and listen to me after. Um, so you don't have to listen to my voice droning on continuously. So, okay, so we are done with composition and we're going to jump into color now. So first and foremost, we are going to understand the concept of a color wheel and color theory. I'm not going to go into extensive detail about it because you can definitely Google and read up on it. There's so many excellent articles out there on color theory and how we would apply it in art. Um, but I do want to talk about conveying mood through color because that is where the creative uh, side of image making comes in. So let's talk about that. And of course, we would have to talk about adding depth with color and visual pathway creation using color. In some ways, we already have done that, you know, as we were looking at composition. Remember, I said desaturated to saturated, cool to warm. So I was talking about color, not just luminosity, right? So we did discuss it, but I want to give some more specific examples so it kind of reiterates those fundamental principles. So let's take a look at the color wheel. Traditionally, warm colors, which are on the left-hand side, tend to be associated with a very upbeat mode, right? They are vibrant, they are inviting, they're enthusiastic, energetic, ebullient, like all the energetic words that you can think of they tend to speak louder. Cool colors tend to be calming, serene. They convey tranquility, a sense of quiet, and sometimes even melancholy. This is important to understand when you are trying to convey a certain mood to your images because by picking which colors you wish to render in your images, you're actually picking what kind of mood you want to convey through your images. Okay, let's take a look at specific examples. Here, notice how I went with the Baroque diagonal, right? And so I arranged the visual elements in such a way that I'm using the trees only to sort of anchor the base of the composition and saying, this is only being included to show you a sense of scale. So yes, I do want you to look at the trees. They are sharply contrasted but it is a story about the massive doom. And it is a story about how light is playing between shadow, the shadow part of the doom and the illuminated part of the doom. Notice the color wheel here. Okay, you see what happened here? We have colors that are at the opposite ends of the wheel, isn't it? The oranges and the reds are opposite to the blues. This is called complementary colors. When we use complementary colors in our frame, it tends to be 
a very energetic image. They are like the wow kind of images, right? They are not the calming kind of images. So complementary colors will add drama, okay? On the other hand, if we use analogous colors, notice here how I am sticking to the same subsection, right? Same um, or uh, adjacent slices of pie, if I can say that in the color wheel. And what's happening? There isn't much drama in terms of color. So analogous colors tend to create more tranquil images, more serene, and they bring more attention to subtle changes in tonality or texture or geometry. You know, you're saying to people, this is not about color. This is more about geometry. This is more about texture. This is more about, you know, the change in luminosity. I don't want you to focus so much on color and I want to convey a calm, quiet scene. But you might be saying, Sapna, how do I decide, right? I mean, how colors are what colors are in nature. I show up at a place to photograph. You know, the colors could be warm. The colors could be cool. How do I get to decide what I'm going to render? The important thing to understand is that quality of light determines colors in a landscape. So if you are thinking of creating an image, that is more calm and serene. And I tend to gravitate towards those more because I like to display those images in medical centers. Then I need to show up at a landscape at a time when the colors are not dramatic. Look at this example. This is tunnel view in Yosemite. The colors are dramatic, right? Why? Because I chose to shoot this at sunset right after a storm. So you have these beautiful golden light showing between the clouds and casting itself on these mountains and creating this dramatic scene. This is a drama scene. And notice how the colors are complementary to each other, adding to the drama. But on the other hand, if I wanted to create a karma scene, I need to show up when the light is muted, right? <clears throat> and you need to come and photograph it before the sunlight hits the mountains. At that time, you have pastel colors. You're kind of sticking to the same subsection of the color wheel. And this image is much more calming than this one, but it's the exact same scene, right? You could literally have shot this, what, a couple of days between each other, right? It's just the kind of atmosphere we seek out will depend on the kind of mood we are trying to create. So dramatic, versus calm. Colors are highly determined by the quality of light and you can decide which quality of light to shoot in. How do we add depth with color? We already talked about this briefly. I said apply transitions, right? So we want to go from dark to light, cool to warm, desaturated to saturated. So you see in this instance, the color that you're seeing on the moss covered rocks sort of draws you in. And there is no accident that we have leading lines going in towards the mountain, right? Because I'm saying, let your eye travel towards the mountain. And then, of course, we have the dead branch, which is also acting as a leading line towards the mountain. Okay. And notice how we have darker foreground and lighter background, sharper foreground and softer background. Depth through the image, but now we're also employing color by using desaturated cool tones in the foreground, transitioning to warmer, brighter colors in the background. Here is another example conveying depth through an image. Does this happen in nature? Yes, it does. So when we pay attention, we are paying attention to what is already happening in nature, but then understanding I need to accentuate that in post-processing because that is how I will bring depth to my image. So decreasing the luminosity, applying a gradient and making your colors cooler and desaturated um, in the foreground and increasing the brightness and softness for something in the background may adds to that depth. Okay, so now moving on, we are going to go to visual pathway using color. We know that the human eye is drawn to points of maximum color, right? So in this instance, I have these beautiful flowers. Why don't I tell the viewer to go from flower to flower to flower till they get into the mountain? 
This was shot in a special way to achieve this effect. You see, when the light was going through the scene, this is what I call a time blend. So my tripod and camera did not change. They stayed where they were, right? But I shot the scene through the entire period of sunset. So I would say I probably shot it for like an hour and a half, right? So at the very beginning, there was light on the flowers. And it was important to catch the flowers illuminated because I am going to use them as stepping stones into my frame. Then the light traveled to the mid-ground and hit the mountains. So I captured that because I want to show the time frame when the mountain was optimally illuminated. And then after that, I, the, when the sun set, we got the change in the clouds. And now I want to show the clouds with a little bit of color. So at no single point in time did the scene look like this. But that's where our creativity comes in, right? We are showcasing every single character in the story in optimal light during the course of that sunset. Okay. So now we have a compelling image because you travel through the color throughout the image. I hope that makes sense. Beautiful photo and location. Yeah. And story. <laughs> yeah. Fun to shoot too. Uh, oh, and by the way, I should mention this one is focus stacked. Uh, it may even be bracketed. Uh, there is a lot that goes in here. I don't think I did a perspective blend on it. So mm -hmm. nothing moved. The camera did not move. And uh, yeah, I did not move the camera or tripod. So I just shot through the scene and then blended the different exposures just to showcase the best light through the whole landscape. All right, <clears throat> moving on, using visual pathway. Um, creating a visual pathway using color. Here, what are we doing? We're using points of color in the foreground, these beautiful flowers. And we're saying, uh, we're going to anchor our composition with it, have the person step in. And then from there, they'll travel to the reflection. And from there, they'll travel to the brighter aspects. Notice again how the colors are cooler in the foreground and darker. And then the colors in the background are brighter and warmer. All of that is deliberate. Was it there in the scene? Yes, absolutely, because the light on the flowers had disappeared by the time the sky got lit up. But understanding that this is how we convey depth means we bring it back into post-processing and sort of accentuate that effect even more. Okay, so what are, we, what are the things we learned in uh, color? We learned, uh, we understood the concept of color wheel and I encourage all of you to read up on color theory. And then we talked about conveying mood through color, you know, warm colors versus cool colors, what they convey. We talked about adding depth with color and finally visual pathway creation using color. So that brings us to the end of the um, theory part of this um, presentation. And uh, I really wanna thank you for um, bearing all through that. If you had heard my stomach growling, it's <laughs> lunchtime, so I'm trying really hard to not get that noise in, but the stomach has its mind of its own, so forgive me for that. And uh, I teach workshops, and currently I have an Aurora Borealis workshop coming up in Norway. Um, and uh, in May, I'll be going to Bhutan, hiking in the Himalayas. And uh, in July, hopefully have a Namibia one coming up as well. And I do a bunch of other workshops that are domestic in America that you can check out on my website. So Raphael, I think we should move on to the... Yes, we have a few questions if you want to uh, answer them now. Sure, and absolutely. Then we move on. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Yes. We have a uh, Dania Malaga. Uh, how important is simplicity in a photo? I'm sorry, come again. How important is simplicity in a photo. Okay. So I think, you know, there was a very famous quote. Uh, I think it was Ansel Adams who, or somebody who said that you bring to an image everything that you are, you know. So like the books you have read, the music you have listened to, the people you have loved, who you really are, you bring to an image, you know. That's why your image will not look like anybody else's, right? So when you say how important is simplicity to an image, it is who you are. If you are minimalistic and you like, mm -hmm. you know, to keep things decluttered, then it's of utmost important that your personality come through your images. Then you'll have somebody who's very dramatic 
and who likes a lot of drama. So they might include a lot more in their image in terms of color, contrast, you know, visual elements, because that is who they are. So if you look at people's um, streams, right, of uh, image, like if you go to somebody's Instagram account and look at it, you kind of get a feeling for what sort of personality they are. And, you know, I am a Gemini, so you'll probably see me all over the place. I do have days when I'm quite overtly dramatic, mm -hmm. and then there are days when I'm quite calm. Um, and so I think it varies. It varies on who you are as a person, and it varies on what end product you want to see. But the most important thing is everything you do in a frame must be deliberate, right? There shouldn't be a distraction added and you didn't notice it. That shouldn't happen. But if you included something saying, I want it to be a part of the frame, then that's your choice. So uh, keeping things simple and decluttered makes it a more compelling story. But for mm -hmm. some, including more visual elements may be their personal style. But again, that doesn't mean it should be cluttered. It should still come across quite clean and strong. Hope that answers the question. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Samna. Uh, then we have Eamon Colin. Uh, when we focus stack landscapes, focus stacking landscapes, we create an image that is very sharp from uh, uh, from the front to to the back. But do you prefer images which are softer towards the background? I think maybe he didn't understand uh, uh, this sharp to 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 soft method. Of, you know, I yeah. I love that you asked that. I wanted to go to this image. Are you able to still see my screen, Rafael? Yes. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so in this image, right, I love that question. Thank you for asking. So in this image, this is focus stacked, right? Because I wanted your eye to land on the flowers and realize that they are sharply defined and textured, and that's why they are close to you, right? That's how I'm conveying depth. The mountains are not quite as sharp as the flowers are, and the clouds are definitely not as sharp as the mountains are. So there is definitely a gradient in terms of how sharpness and texture are being conveyed through this image. And that gradient is what is creating that feeling of depth. Mm -hmm. So when you shoot, you will shoot to focus that through the flowers. You will have a point where you have your focus on the mountain and you will have an image where your focus is on the clouds. But when you bring it back into Photoshop and you're blending all these images together, it is important that you don't make everything tack sharp, you know, like HDR-ish kind of, like everything is textured and sharp. Because if we do that, then we are basically eliminating what we saw in the landscape. We didn't see it like that. We didn't see everything in sharp focus. And if we are trying to create the same feeling that we had when we saw the landscape, why are we making everything super sharp? right? That just doesn't convey that sense of depth or that ethereal dreamy feeling we get when we look off into the distance. So when we bring it back into post-processing, it's important to understand, yes, I need to have my foreground very sharp and focused and textured, but when it comes to the mid-ground, it won't be as sharp. And then, of course, the very distant background will not be as sharp. So you decide how much of autumn effect or blur you mm -hmm. wish to apply to each section of the frame in order to convey that feeling of depth. And that's very important to do. So you will introduce just a faint amount of blur. Now, you, you have to shoot everything in focus because you don't want to have anything that looks unfocused, right? Mm -hmm. All you're doing is adding depth. That doesn't mean things are out of focus. They're just a little bit softer. So it's mm -hmm. good to focus that, bring it back, and then do the selective adjustments in each particular part of your frame to render that feeling of depth. Okay, thank you. And one last question before we move on to the to the photos people have submitted. Um, Alessandro Curro, no, for example, no, Jay Brown, how much time estimate uh, do you spend for planning on an image composition uh, how, how much time do you invest in, in in finding the composition and planning for the conditions so majority of the time that i invest is actually in getting to know a place you know so i like to get to a place uh, give myself a couple of days at least uh, to wander around not really shoot anything maybe take my phone but sort of see you know, and I don't even get there during necessarily the best light, right? I'm just hiking. I'm trying to establish an emotional connection to the place and just soak it in. 
um, kind of like not worry too much about the technical aspects of photography, but just say, what a wonderful place to be. What a wonderful experience to have, right? So first I spend a couple of days doing that and then identifying what would be good to photograph like this um, particular part of the landscape or this rock or you know this lake or whatever it is uh, in that area. Once that is done, then I have to understand how is the light going to travel through it, right? Like give yourself time to watch it as the light travels through and say, what is it illuminating? You know, what is the story going to be like? The actual shooting doesn't come until later. And honestly, what the story is about is completely dependent on what light is doing that day, right? So I could do all of this planning and say, I want to shoot the sunset with a sun star coming out at such and such a place, like that picture you saw of the uh, lilies, right? Um, the kale lilies in the valley uh, in uh, not Northern California. That shot, you have to go back again and again because the sun may be obscured by clouds. It might be, you know, not at the right place because it moves through the uh, different uh, months of the year. The flowers may not be blooming at the right place. So it's very varied. I mean, I must have made like three or four trips and realized I still can't get the shot right now. I have to wait. Um, so that will take time. But once you get there and say things align themselves and everything is set, then we have to be very quick in our compositions because you have to react to the light. There will be a certain set of flowers that are being backlit at one point. There'll be another set of flowers that are being backlit at another point. So you switch your composition accordingly based on what nature is unfolding before you. Once you have the basic principles in your head about this is what the story is about and this is how I usually compose, this is how I use color, it comes together pretty quickly actually. And the more you practice it, the more you're able to react quite quickly. And then of course, there are those exotic locations we get to once in a blue moon, right? I mean, we had this expensive trip to Namibia and I get there and I can't say I'm gonna come back another day and there only one day a dead flare. Mm. I have to take whatever is delivered. There is no time to plan, bond or do any of that stuff. Over there, what I'm doing is okay, I'm gonna stand before the scene and wait for the drama to unfold and whatever happens, whatever nature tells me to shoot, that's what I'm gonna shoot. So, you know, I didn't know those dunes do the light and shadow thing and that there is a tree that's going to be illuminated. I was off somewhere shooting an oryx, you know, with a long lens. I turn around and I see these, this interplay of light and shadow and I see that sliver of light hitting the tree, run back quickly, set myself up and say, oh my God, this is what the story is about. Mm -hmm. It's very varied and uh, it can be long drawn out or it can be very fast based on what nature delivers. We just have to learn to react to that. Awesome, Sanna. Thank you so much for uh, the presentation. And uh, I can't wait to see and to hear what you have to say about the photos. Yeah. The photo Let's have take a look and so see. Far. Now that we have learned all of these principles, uh, I think it will be nice to apply them. And one word of caution, uh, see, art is very subjective, right? So if I say a picture is good, or if I say a picture isn't working for me, it's only me, it's not you. So mm -hmm. I think you have to take it with a grain of salt in that each one of us has a different aesthetic. We're coming from a different place. We have a different creative mindset. And that's why what works for one person will not work for another person. So if I am being a little bit harsh um, regarding an image, um, it's, it's because I don't see the beauty in it. Um, but I'm sure there are others in the world who will see the beauty in your images. So please don't don't feel bad if I say something that um, might might offend you. That's not my intention. My intention is purely how can we learn from this experience and how can we go forward and make more compelling images. So no, no worry at all, Sana. We are like a family here, so okay. all good. <laughs> okay. okay. So did you want to share your screen and we can go from image to image? Or? Yes, I could do that. Okay. Let's do that. Do that. Let me. So I'll close this one. Opa. Present share screen. Okay, do you see? Yes. I do. Perfect. Yeah. Just let me know if you want to uh, pass the photos. Okay. I'm actually putting them in full screen so I can see them. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So let's um, start off with weight distribution here. Okay, no, let's start off with the basics here, right? The first and foremost thing is focal points. So when I look at this image, it's clear to me that the photographer was drawn to two things. One is the moon and the other is the light on the mountain, right? There's no mystery about that. Okay, so we have identified our focal points. Next, what do we need to do? We need to look at weight distribution. So what's happening here is that the mountains on the left-hand side are getting a significant part of the real estate and the moon is sort of being pushed to the periphery and not getting as much of the real estate. Okay, And then we have one more visual element that is attracting our attention at the bottom right-hand side. You see that area of sharp contrast, the darkness. So what is happening now in my visual pathway is I look at these mountains with the beautiful light drawn to the whiteness of the moon. Then I come down to the bottom right corner, halt there because I don't understand what that is about. And then I come back into the mountain. So the visual pathway here is a triangle which is going around like this, right? So if the story was about the mountains and the moon, perhaps removing whatever it was that we saw on the bottom right would be a good thing to do, okay? So let's say we removed it. And now we have two main characters on the stage. We have the mountain and we have the moon. We need to have enough of a negative space around both of our main characters to give them room to talk, right? On the, if, if we put the moon that much to the periphery, then we sort of are saying, this is not so important, don't look at it. Which is not true because the photographer chose to give a ton of negative space above the landscape, specifically to bring out the contrast in the moon and say, I want you to look at this. But this reminds me of the shot by Ansel Adams, Moonrise Over Hernandez, where the landscape takes a smaller part of the real estate and then the sky takes up a whole lot of um, real estate but doesn't have anything to draw your eye into it except the moon, right? Very reminiscent of Moonrise Over Hernandez by Ansel Adams. But what's happening is the moon is not being put in a place where you have enough of a significance being given to it. So I would frame it a little bit differently where I would have more room around the moon on the right hand side. Maybe zoom out a little bit and change your angle and perspective to it. Um, and then remove whatever is distracting on the bottom right because uh, that is not really adding to our uh, story. Uh, I think that that should pretty much work. Great. Uh, next. I like this for the color scheme quite a bit, actually. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I like how, you know, this person has chosen analogous colors. Obviously, their intention is to create a serene, calm image. Reflections tend to do that. And this is being done very nicely. I like the fact that my attention goes to the main center, central aspect of the frame and the reflection. It doesn't, even though there are pieces of the iceberg that are going towards the periphery because they're not illuminated, they don't really attract my attention. Notice how he or she flagrantly ignored the rule of thirds and said, I'm going to put my line smack dab in the middle of the frame. Reflection images often tend to work great when you do that because what you're saying is I have equal weight distribution for my subject as well as the reflection because both of them have equal importance in my visual story. So that's why this image works well. And I like the light vignette around the frame to keep everything in the middle. And the geography, the, the geometry that you're seeing in terms of the lines coming together will keep us occupied in the middle of the frame. I also like that tiny looks like a bird that's sitting on, mm -hmm. on the yeah. left side Beautiful. there. That's kind of cute. Like, see, even that tiny point of contrast will attract our attention, right? So you look at the bird and you go, oh, I get a sense of scale for how big this is now. And I see the reflection of the bird, wow, you know? So you start like really getting emotionally invested in the image as your eye travels around it and picks up more, uh, more of the details, but you don't really travel out of the frame. And so mission accomplished. Nice. So this is a nice, simple, straightforward image. You say, you know, I liked the geometry here, beautiful curves, I liked the soft color, and I'm going to interplay the soft colors here. 
Notice how these are complementary colors, right? If you look at orange and you look at green, you're looking at opposite ends of the color wheel. So you're essentially adding drama. If you are going to add drama and you're not necessarily looking for a serene, calming image, you can even accentuate the colors even more. Do you want them to pop? Do you want it to be a dramatic portrait? Or are you looking for more calming colors? If you're looking for more calming effect, then now you, the green uh, cannot pop as much. The orange cannot pop as much. So you can adjust your colors based on what you want to showcase. And, you know, because you kept it simple and there is nothing else distracting, you know, it's just a simple, straightforward image, placing the subject in the middle of the frame works. Um, there is no differential light here, right? It's flat light. When we have flat light, it tends to not give a 3D feeling to the image. Remember that apple I showed you with the flat light versus angled light? So mm -hmm. this image would probably have been a lot more interesting if we had backlight or if we had angled light, then maybe the translucent nature of the petals would come about, you know, color would have a different interplay. It would really look more 3D, isn't it? Um, but I like that conscious decision to keep a bokeh for the background and not have anything distracting. That works for me. Thank you, Sandra. That is the photo we, you covered. Yes. Yes, I think uh, that was a good image. Yeah, I mean, just did, you know, tweaking because you can see how we are giving uh, such a large part of our, our real estate to something that doesn't really add to our main mm -hmm. characters of the story. So every time that subdividing your frame and asking yourself, does every sub part of my frame contribute to the story is extremely important. Okay, you are asking me to look at something that I don't usually show. So I cannot profess to be an expert in this. It looks like a beautiful panel. Uh, got the lights uh, going and that looks nice. I can look at the color scheme and say it fits well. You know, it is showing sunset and lights and the atmosphere is being conveyed quite well. Um, as far as the story goes, my eye does travel through the frame and then goes to that sunset uh, light that we are seeing on the right hand side. Um, there is a lot to take in, in this image, isn't it? So I think this is a very detail oriented image, uh, perhaps something that would look good if you really printed it big and delved into it and looked through. Um, mm -hmm. Not much I could change about it really. Well, yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. So here, let's say, what is the visual element that attracted your attention? I'm sure it was this rock face, quite impressive, right? What is the other visual element that really attracted your attention? The clouds. You like the cloud cover. Okay. I get it. This is a story of the rocks and the sky above. Again, uh, notice how the light is sort of flat through the frame, right? So composition wise, you have it going. Uh, this is sort of a reverse diagonal, if you will. It's not our, um, uh, you know, Baroque diagonal that going the other way, but it's okay because we have oblique lines playing into this. The thing that makes it a difficult um, image to post-process and to convey that sense of 3D feeling is because that angled light is still not quite there. You see a little bit of it. See how like the front face is being illuminated and you have a piece that is not illuminated, so it does render a certain amount of 3D effect. Um, but majority of it is still in relatively flat light. And then one thing I would recommend is if you want the eye to travel up towards the rocks, then maybe decreasing the luminance for the foreground, you know, darkening it a little bit will add some depth to the image, right? Because you're looking at going from dark to light, a transition that will add depth to the image, perhaps a slight vignette so that my eye doesn't travel out of the frame, you know, because the clouds are radiating towards the top right corner. So what happens? Like a leading line, my eye will go out of the frame. So preventing that and adding a slight vignette um, and just a different time of day to shoot it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, would have worked, I think, because you would uh, capitalize on more angled light, giving a more 3D feeling, probably capitalize on change in color in the clouds, 
um, and you know the light would have gone past the foreground right as it travels up the mountain remember what i showed you the flowers at uh, in the dolomites that image where um, you could see that the foreground light had disappeared and then the light had hit the background rocks only so a time will come in this landscape when the light travels like that and that would be the decisive moment to shoot it because the story is about the rocks and the sky thank you samna thank you i like um, this image i think uh, it has a nice way to st of inviting you to step in right the foreground uh, texture in the rocks kind of gets you in there you know that it's sharp so it's kind of closer to you and then you travel through that leading line and the warm uh, light that is there on the rocks uh, kind of catches your attention and the architecture of the rocks um so there is there is a clarity to the story um could you compose it a little bit differently sure because right now what you did is you placed the horizon in the middle of the frame right you could decide uh, to place it in the top third or the bottom third depending on how much relevance you want to give to your main focal point which is uh, the rocks in the background right right now you're sharing the real estate between your uh, foreground rocks uh, and the background rocks sort of but if you were to throw them up more massively um, and reduce the uh, the real estate you invest in your foreground rocks maybe that would be one approach to take or uh, the other way somehow like putting the horizon in the middle in this instance um, I think it will be interesting to see what the others look like maybe this is the best option but it's just something to think about um, hope. and when you're there in the field play around with your perspective so get lower get higher you know move to one side move to another side and see how the composition will come together for each of those nice tips mm -hmm. mm. beautiful milky way uh, layered over a lake um, I like the fact that you chose to portray it in a vertical format because obviously the story is the Milky Way and I'm sure by post-processing it you could make this pop a lot more. Um, one of the things that I like to do when we're shooting the Milky Way is to see if we can do like a, a time blend again because there will be a time when those trees might have just a little bit of light on them right to bring out a little bit of the details because right now What's happening is we have a significant part of our frame lacking shadow detail completely. So it's just like a black uh, area. Uh, you can see a teeny bit of detail, but not too much. But if we have chosen to do a blue or blend and say, I'm going to shoot these trees when there's a little bit of light on it, bring out a little bit of detail, it will almost seem like there is some sort of illumination going on, soft illumination in the trees. I think that would have worked. And then on the right side, there is something there. There is a visual element that is catching my attention at the edge of the frame. Remember, we talked about border patrol. So if we want to include something in the frame, then uh, make sure that it's not partially cut off. Make sure that you have enough negative space around it, breathing room, so that uh, it kind of completes that. Um, yeah, and I love the fact that you have a shooting star in there. And what would have been interesting is were you able to get a reflection? Because I see that you're reflecting the stars, right? Would it have been nice to get a reflection of the Milky Way in the water as well? That would have been very interesting. Then, of course, we would have adjusted our composition differently for reflection images, you know, probably put mm -hmm. the horizon more towards the middle because now you're giving equal real estate to the Milky Way as well as its reflection. Thank you. Beautiful panel conveying a nice sense of openness um, to the space. And I like uh, how the water um, adds a nice flow to the image. Um, again, uh, the light is kind of similar all the way through in that it is uh, soft. So you see, when you ask yourself, how is my eye traveling through the frame? It, it kind of goes all around, isn't it? It's a good thing that we have two um, hills that we will travel around. So we'll go to the hill, you know, any kind of peak will attract our attention, right? Because that's a point of sharp contrast. So you see what's happening. The clouds are bright 
and there is a sharp contrast where that hill or mountain is sticking up. So your eye is going to travel there. And then the one on the right hand side has a similar configuration. So your eye is going to go there. So you will bounce back and forth between those two hills while taking in the whole scene. Uh, maybe applying a light vignette so you keep everything in the middle of the frame. And I like how you're drawing the viewer's eye in with the water that is going between the two hills. Right. So just adding a little bit of vignette, I think, and darkening the foreground so you actually achieve that transition to convey that feeling of depth would probably work. And then if it's um, really, you know, you could even like uh, crop some of the sides off because if it's really a story about what's happening in the middle, we probably um, could get rid of some of the distraction that's happening on the left-hand side. But then again, if you prefer to have that open feeling, this works too. Just a light vignette though, to keep the eye in the middle. We love leading lines, right? Because they tell us um, where to go. Uh, and the important thing to consider in a leading line is if we are going to have a strong leading line, it must lead us to the focal point in the image. It must lead us to where we want the eye to travel and rest. I like the fact that you incorporated a leading line. I like the way you draw it in from the bottom left and going into the distance. It definitely conveys a feeling of depth. But when I travel along the leading line, I'm now coming to very contrasted trees that don't necessarily convey a sense of you know, an ethereal feeling. And the reason why may actually be twofold. One, we do not have visual separation between the trees, isn't it? They're all clumped together, which kind of feels like the road is coming to an end right there. And the second thing is the quality of light. This was shot most likely midday when the light is still very harsh. And that's why you see there is a sharp contrast between the grass, the light on the grass, the light on the trees, perhaps shooting this during periods of angled light and positioning ourselves in such a way where instead of being this far back, you get to the point where the S-curve goes somewhere and showing something in the background, you know, even if it shows just open sky, it's not obscured. The end of the pathway is not obscured. I think it would open out your composition a lot. I love the way you paid attention to the fence along the margins and used that as leading lines, right? Along with the path or the road, it draws my eye into the frame. So my only um, suggestion for this would be if you are leading someone into a set, subsection of your frame, make sure you're leading them to something you want their eyes to land on that has visual separation, that has a good, strong focal point. And uh, if we did a border patrol, there is just like one tree on the right-hand side that you know maybe we include a little bit more space so we don't cut that off a little fence post on the right hand side and that edge of the tree so to try not to cut off trees if possible you know sometimes mm -hmm. it's just not possible but if possible try that thank you Sandra. i liked this image uh, again notice how when the reflections we automatically tend to give a lot of weightage to the reflection as much as we give to the composition uh, I played around with this a little bit and, uh, you know, when I was editing it, I noticed that you could actually bring out uh, more drama in the mountain and its reflection by sort of vignetting around it, underplaying the foreground a little bit, because the foreground is a horizontal line right now, right? So it's sort of like static. Uh, if we had... Uh, leading lines coming from the edge of the frame. Like say we had rocks that were arranged in such a way that they lead the viewer's eye towards our central subject, which is the mountain and the reflection. That would really work. But when you have a horizontal foreground line, and when it is like this dark and contrasty, it sort of stops the viewer. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, uh, perhaps looking for some rocks or something that will lead the viewer's eye in. But uh, given, uh, other than that, I like the stillness of the water, the beautiful reflection that you got. I like how the clouds are playing into it, the leading line of the clouds telling you, hey, look at the mountain. This is where the action is happening. 
one thing that we may not be seeing enough of is that shading of the apple effect I talked about because the light at this point is straight on. It's on for us on the mountain, right? It's not coming from a side per se. And therefore, that 3D relief, that shading of the apple is not happening yet. And if we have that, I think it will make it even more 3D. Mm -hmm. um, things to think about. Thank you. Oops. That's... Uh... Okay. All right. So this is obviously a portrait of the moon. I like the simplicity of this image. Uh, I like the photographer being so gutsy that the sky has no detail because they're like, don't, want, don't worry about it. The point of sharpest contrast is the moon. I want you to look at it. And uh, obviously it looks like this was a time blend. So it was shot during the golden hour when there was still illumination on the mountain face. And then it was shot after the moon rose up with a dark sky behind it. Um, it it's sort of an artistic treatment uh, of the composite. And it's really an individual choice uh, at this point. Uh, for me, uh, I like to keep it a little bit more realistic. So what I would have done is uh, probably shot the moon uh, not as contrasty, you know, kept it more translucent, not as opaque, the sky not as dark. So it's sort of like the quality of light is flowing through the scene. So it looks like it kind of all happened at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so adjusting the exposure of the sky, adjusting the exposure of the moon, adjusting the opacity of the moon to kind of reflect that there was beautiful golden light playing on the peaks at the time the moonrise was happening. And remember, mm -hmm. if the moon is just rising and there's still light in the sky, it would be a lot less opaque than it is in, in this frame. So something to think about. And the other thing I would say is, even if you had to have a little bit of visual separation, right, between that peak and the moon, I know with photo pills, you can time things exactly. So it's kind of tempting to say, look, I have it exactly next to the peak. But in this case, it is an important focal point, right? So it's good to have negative space around it wait for it to rise up a little bit and once it rises up a little bit and you have that negative space now you have a nice dialogue nice visual tension going on between the moon and the mountain face so that's how, that's what i would recommend this is what i talk about when i say visual separation right this is a story of trees and i love how this person took the effort to say, I'm going to separate each one of these trees. I'm going to put my horizon at the bottom thirds. This is a story about the trees, and so I'm going to accentuate their height against the sky. Um, all of the elements are coming together very beautifully in this image. Uh, now, will there be complete visual separation in nature? Sometimes not, you know, like you could argue, well, those two trees on the right are touching each other. You know, there are limitations. Nature is giving us a certain amount of liberty when it comes to composition. But ultimately, we're shooting what's already there. And I think given what was already there, this is a, a nice uh, rendition. Mm -hmm. Like it, I like the fact that my eye doesn't travel out of the frame. There is absolutely nothing distracting me from looking at the trees beautiful horizon line, the little tiny tree also adds so much drama. So, you know, all of the characters are having a beautiful dialogue on the stage here, like it. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the focal points here. Like, what is this story about? So when I look at this image, I'm left wondering, was the photographer drawn to the architecture of the trees on the right-hand side? Was he drawn to the color of the grass or flowers on the left hand side, right? And if you're composing like this, I'm assuming that you are as enamored with the trees on the right as you were with the color in the field because you have given that much real estate in your frame to the trees. So the oblique uh, diagonal that we are seeing here is going from the top left to the bottom right, right? That's how we have divided the frame. This is a difficult image uh, to create a strong visual pathway because what we, if, if that was your intention and you want the viewer to go from the trees to the field and from the field to the trees, 
because everything is happening sort of in the top two thirds, it becomes a difficult visual pathway. There is no place for the viewer to actually step into the frame in the foreground, right? Because everything is equally illuminated. There is no transition. There is no sense of depth being conveyed. Um, I wonder how it would be if we incorporated less of the trees and less of this bottom right bush, right? So we did incorporate that beautiful graceful branch that is coming over the um, field of flowers or grass but we don't include all of the rest of the trees because they're giving a very cluttered uh, composition and our eye is drawn to that area of contrast so you kind of are subtracting from the beautiful color in your frame right there's beautiful yellows there's beautiful blues beautiful complementary colors but then what are we doing we are subtracting the impact of that beautiful color play by incorporating structure, texture, contrast on the right side of the frame and giving up that much of real estate to it. Okay, So I would mm -hmm. reframe it in such a way to have less of the trees, more of the beautiful color that's playing. And then you have, you know, that pole or whatever it is that's sticking up that would have to be removed so it doesn't mm -hmm your visual pathway you would darken down the foreground a little bit and that should hopefully work better mm -hmm. okay. this is a pretty straightforward shot uh, beautiful planning thanks to photo pebbles and you nailed it perfectly um, not too much more we can say about that i mean this i know who the hero in the story is <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. if you will and uh, you know nothing distracting me from looking straight at it and going you know you, you put, lined it up perfectly and I'm sure that was your intention. Oh, in that previous image, Raphael, I also like where uh, that uh, horizon line was put. You know because you're trying to make the um, lighthouse uh, look kind of. Uh, more prominent and you're trying to make the moon the story of it. So it's nice that the water, which really doesn't add that much to the story, um, is sort of minim minimalistic there. So I like that horizon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh okay. Remember what I said about how the focal points will just jump out at you, right? You look at this, and the tree is like, look at me, look at me. Why is it doing that? Because it is surrounded by fog, right? It's an area of sharp contrast. So you have no choice but to look at the tree. And you know, there's a story about the tree. And I like how this is playing out. Um, if you wanted the viewer to travel from the tree to whatever that path is that is above the tree, the road, and then go up into the fog above the road, then this is doing that. But if you wanted the viewer to stay on the tree and sort of just soak in the atmosphere, then that road becomes distracting. Mm -hmm. So you have to question yourself, what is my purpose? Where do I want the viewer's eye to land? Where do I want to stay it? Uh, keep it. Now you could argue, uh, Sapna, I want one focal point to be on the tree and the other focal point to be the fog in the distance. And I'm going to use this leading line to go back and forth, back and forth. That works. You would probably want a greater uh, separation in terms of left to right, right? So if the tree was more to the left and the fog was more to the right, probably have a better visual tension and better dialogue going on between those two. Um, especially because you have this bright area bottom left that also attracts my attention. Right? So if we could weight distribute in such a way that we balance the fog at the bottom left with, and the tree with the fog on the top, I think um, maybe just moving yourself around a little bit and seeing. Or, um, or you go more minimalistic and say, I don't even want to showcase the road. I don't want to accentuate it, uh, decrease the significance of it. That's a personal choice. And then also applying a light vignette so we keep everything sort of in the middle of the frame because we do have very bright illuminated fog that is coming to the peripheral aspects of the frame. So it'll take our eye out. Keep that in mind. We don't want the viewer's eye to go out. So maybe uh, applying a light vignette all around would work. Um, <laughs> Some, uh, um, we have time for a few more photos. Yeah, we could probably do a couple more. A couple more. Yeah. Perfect. Let's do something. Boom, boom, boom. For example. Oh, that, that, okay. Which okay. one do you prefer? Comment? Yeah, I like this. Um, you know, it's a it's a question of the decisive moment, right? Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful image of uh, waves crashing on the rocks, um, and 
you know, because you chose that shorter shutter speed, you were able to freeze the birds. You know, it's like one spellbinding moment and I have it, look at it. Right. Um, so I love that. Um, the only thing that um, this works for me, the only thing that is catching my eye is on the bottom right hand side, that area of uh, contrast, right? So that rock um, is sort of like taking the viewer's eye to the periphery and you have a tree that is chopped off in half. So maybe moving more towards the left side uh, or moving more, more towards the right side, sorry, and throwing the um, tree out of your frame. So you, it's more a story about the waves crashing against the rocks um, or maybe just zooming in a little bit. So uh, you give more importance to the main uh, focal point there. Um, yeah, but otherwise I think uh, it works. And I like uh, all of the texture that's being retained in the way, uh, in the way that looks very nice. It looks like an explosion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was one that you had, uh, uh, I think this is the same person, right? Yeah. I think it's the same one. And this yeah. one. That one too. One. Yeah. There was one where you had a nice visual pathway when you were scrolling through that. Mm -hmm. that uh, Let me... uh, it was a stream, I think. Uh, well, that's beautiful too. Can we look at the calming layers? The past. Yeah. yeah. This one? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes um, you, you, I, I love scenes like this that are minimalistic. I absolutely love what the person did here. If their intention was to convey a serene, calm scene, they showed up before the sun, you see. So they shot before the colors changed. So what happened was they were able to select colors closer together, kind of, and have that analogous feeling to them. Right? The oranges are still not popping that much, right? Once they pop, it will become a much more dramatic scene. So it conveys that sense of serenity and calm. And you have such a beautiful transition from the cool to the warm, right? From the sharp to the soft, from the dark to the light. So you see, even though uh, it all is sort of in muted light, you can see how the person was able to convey depth by applying those transitions. So that's important to understand. Why does it feel like this image has a lot of depth, even though all of it is in the same flat? muted light is because of those transitions. So once we start recognizing that and start harnessing it and employing it in our images, they become much more uh, 3D. Once you understand the color wheel, you can try to manipulate it and shoot at a time when, you know, the mood of an image is being determined by you uh, because you're picking the quality of light that you're going to shoot. Right? Samna, thank you so much for the presentation today. Let me stop sharing. The screen. Uh, wow, you covered uh, almost all the photos. It's been uh, incredible. I think people in the chat is uh, super happy. We have a few questions, but uh, we're reaching two hours already. And uh, I am okay with taking a couple of questions if you are still yes. laughing there. My stomach awesome. already growled and gave up on me. <laughs> <laughs> For here, here is dinner time, so, uh, to, so uh, let's give it like five minutes more. Yeah, uh, because we have people yeah. asking for your post processing, you know, uh, tips. Uh, maybe one day you can come back and uh, give us a hint on how you post process your images, but you want to give a few hints now. Um, yes, I, I think that's a great idea, Raphael. I was thinking like I'll do top uh, 10 tips for post processing, you know, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and not necessarily take an image to completion, but show you tricks that you can use and like have them in your arsenal to kind of develop it. And uh, I also am developing the landscape photography learning module for Adobe for Lightroom mm -hmm. Academy. So I'm writing chapters in that. And in that I do discuss all of the principles I talked about. I'll also be obviously talking about post-processing because I'm developing it for Adobe. That one, uh, I've just written the first few chapters and it is a work in progress, but it should be released sometime next year on the Adobe platform. And it is free for everyone to use, to read, you know, and I think that could be a nice resource for people to have. So that's in the making now. Perfecto, perfecto. I'm looking forward to it and to have you back next year, maybe if you want yes. to come back. Yes. Um, let me find an image. Drone dots. 
is asking, uh, <clears throat> they have studies showing music being helpful with healing. Do you think visual images also are important to healing? 100%. Actually, there are published papers that show that visual therapy is actually an integral part um, in, in the whole uh, healing uh, process. And, uh, you know, the mindset that people have uh, when they look at certain um, images is altered. Uh, what kind of images they're constantly fed. Um, so, yes, visual therapy is a, is a real thing, just like music therapy. And uh, colors have a huge influence on your state of mind. You know, that's why when we say that cool colors are calming, warm colors are energetic, we're actually trying to convey something. And even in the hospital, I was not allowed to put up any sunrise or sunset images because they tend to be overtly dramatic. And every sunset looks, every sunrise looks like a sunset and it sort of implies impending doom for some people. So what we do is go with the more harmonious uh, blue and green tones and those tend to be more healing. Um, so yes, definitely, huge, huge role in visual therapy. Samna, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all, all your expertise here with the uh, Philippines community. And uh, I know, I think it's time to say goodbye. Do you want to say any other words before we say goodbye well, to everyone? Um, you, know, you know, I just want to thank you all so much for, um, you know, your time and attention. And I know there will be times when we feel sort of, you know, in the rut. And we feel like depressed when we look at what's going on sometimes in social media and all that. So my only advice to you is don't compare yourself to others. You know, your own, our only goal should be to make the next image a little bit better than the last one we had. It's an individual journey and um, it's best not to compare and just have fun on our journey and just try to indulge in self-improvement. And that's it. Awesome. So thank, nice. you. thank you so much. Thank you. Nice uh Thanks. well everyone thank you for joining us uh we still have almost you know over 165 people <laughs> alive bearing with us two hours with some already what a pleasure and it's time to say goodbye so thank you so much for watching if you like this video as always give it a like subscribe you can share the, this class with uh, everybody your friends uh, it's going to be available on our youtube channel right now and and that's it and remember that you have the power to imagine plan and shoot legendary photos so <laughs> bye bye everyone and uh have a nice day bye bye till next <laughs> wednesday bye bye thank you samna love you thank you